we'll get started with our introductions so that when he joins us, we'll be ready to get to the, or close to getting to the main event. Um, my name is Christine Fearhenzi, and I want to say good evening and welcome to one and all to Fordham Theology's Spring 2022 First Year Plenary Lecture entitled Forces for Good. What a great title, right? Forces for Good. Um, climate, climate Crises, Public Policy, and Religious Witness, featuring our special guest, Ibrahim Abdul Mateen, in conversation with our theology colleague, Dr. Christiana Zenner. As chair of the Department of Theology, it's my great honor to welcome you and to begin tonight's proceedings um, by doing some more welcoming, some thank yous, and giving you a little brief background on the event you're about to experience together. First, again, a very warm welcome to our live audience here at Lincoln Center and also in Tognino Hall at our Rose Hill campus. I think we should take a count and see whether Lincoln Center or Rose Hill got the most people. We have a great crowd here, but there are still some seats, so please find a seat as you come in as well as those who will be viewing this virtually or later in recorded format. We want to especially welcome our first year students and everyone taking faith in critical reason um, because it's for you that this event has been especially planned along with your instructors and anyone else who's joining us tonight or watching subsequently. Thank yous. We are very thankful to our speakers to our faculty planning team, consisting of Dr. Kathy Cuny, Dr. Bob Davis, and Dr. Christiana Zenner, as well as to our office team, Sue Persiasepi and Kelly McCary McGuire, whose patient and generous efforts have been indispensable to making us th all this happen tonight. We also want to most graciously and gratefully acknowledge the gift of major support for this program, which has been given by Jack Schmidt, and Sylvia Picard Schmidt, both of them alumna, alumni of Fordham, and we are very honored that they're first year undergraduate class in an introductory core call, course called Faith and Critical Reason. This class introduces participants to critical religious and theological inquiry, and students and teachers grapple with questions of justice and human flourishing in our contemporary world. Since 2018, the Fordham Theology First Year Experience has brought to campus a good number of really distinguished guest speakers to address all our students enrolled in this class, either in person or later virtually, in dialogue with a specific text that is read and discussed by every section of the class across all, both campuses of the university. At these highly anticipated events, our students' own reflections are really enriched by the opportunity to engage with eminent speakers who share with us their own distinctive experiences, perspectives, and expertise on course-relevant issues and themes. In the face of the racial, social, and ecological crises and challenging, challenges confronting the U.S. today, our faculty this year selected James Cohn's path-breaking 2000 essay entitled, Whose Earth Is It Anyway?, for our first year critical reading and reflection this year. In it, Cohn, who is the founder of U.S. Black Liberation Theology, links the history of colonialism and the genocide of Native Americans with the enslavement of Africans and the exploitation of land, and he argues from his Christian perspective that ecological and social liberation have to necessarily be interwoven. In a few minutes, our guest speaker and discussant will take up with us the ecological, social, and religious issues that, is, that are raised in Cohn's essay in light of our current historical moment, a moment that we all know is fraught, heavy, and marred by crises and uncertainty. Globally, internationally, Ukraine, nationally, and we could name so many things here, right? And locally, as close as Brooklyn this morning. We are confronted with violence, with suffering, and divisions that cry out for justice and redress, but which, which, which also threaten to overwhelm our capacities even to understand, much less eff efficaciously respond. In the face of all this, where can we turn to find the wisdom and the courage and the insight that we need? How can we identify and align ourselves with forces for good? 
and become active participants rather than just recipients or passive or paralyzed, um, active participants and promoters of these forces for good. This is really at the heart of what affordable education is all about, at least what we hope it's about. And at the heart, of, I think, of many of our lives uh, beyond Fordham. Such questions are not merely intellectual, are they? They're certainly not abstract or theoretical. They're existential questions. They're urgent, and they're practical questions. They're not just about ideas. They're about what are we supposed to do? Our learned speakers this evening are steeped in these kinds of questions and these kinds of actions, and they are going to help us address them in light of their own engagement with them through the lenses of policy, ethics, activism, and the resources that spiritual and religious traditions can offer. The forces for not good in our world today are strong, complicated, and seemingly ubiquitous. The 500-year Jesuit Catholic educational tradition to which Fordham University is heir with all its flaws and failings continues to stand for and hopes to cultivate in our students and constituencies critical intellectual, ethical, practical, and spiritual resources that can sustain realistic hope and powerful action for the better world we so badly need. To that end, we look forward eagerly to the wisdom, knowledge, and inspiration we will share this evening, um, not just listening to our speakers, but also engaging with you and your questions and your comments as the evening goes on. At this time, I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, Dr. Kathy Cuny, who is a professor of Islamic studies and also one of our planning team for this event, who will be introducing our main speakers. Thank you, Kathy. Another thing that's neat about this week is that we have three holy seasons intersecting, Western Christian Holy Week, Ramadan, and Passover is coming up this week. So it's not often those three intersect, so we're in this sort of a zone of holy seasons. So hopefully that will be inspiring to us as well. While we're waiting, let me give you a preview. You mo I think most people got a little piece of paper with a little, um, what's that called? Not a hash. QR code. Q thank you. QR code. <laughs> Not a digital native. Uh, a QR code into which we, will ho we hope you will put uh, questions for the speakers as they occur to you while the conversation is going on. We're going to collect those and collate them and sort of like cluster them, you know, so that we can then give them up to the speakers. Um, and here come the speakers right now. Um, welcome, welcome, and uh, now Kathy Cuny is going to introduce you. Do you want to just? Sure. Yeah, you can go up to the to your seats. Okay. Thank you. So welcome and good evening. Assalamu alaikum wa Ramadan Mubarak. I have the honor tonight of introducing our two guests for this timely conversation on forces for good. Our moderator, Christiana Zenner, is Associate Professor of Theology, Science, and Ethics at Fordham University Lincoln Center, where she also serves as the Associate Chair for Undergraduate Education in the Department of Theology. Dr. Zenner is the author of the book, just Water, Theology, Ethics, and Global Freshwater Crises, which was published in 2014 with a revised edition in 2018. She is co-editor of two scholarly books on bioethics and sustainability, and the author of more than a dozen peer-reviewed articles on theology and science, freshwater values and ethics, and the ecological turn in Catholic social thought. 
In addition to teaching faith and critical reason, Dr. Zenner teaches classes like religion and ecology, human nature after Darwin, and Anthropocene sciences, fictions, and ethics. Dr. Zenner's public-facing scholarship includes educational videos with TED-Ed, articles with The New Republic, The Washington Post, CNN.com, interviews with Public Radio International, and quotations in The New York Times, The Christian Science Monitor, and others. In 2013, she was named one of Microsoft's heroes in education. Dr. Zenner holds a PhD in Religious Studies from Yale University and a Bachelor's in Human Biology from Stanford University. Dr. Zenner's conversation partner this evening will be our esteemed guest, Ibrahim Abdelmatin. Ibrahim Abdelmatin is an urban strategist whose work focuses on deepening democracy and improving public engagement. He has advised two mayors on the best ways to translate complex decisions related to the cost, impacts, and benefits of environmental policy and of capital projects on communities. Ibrahim has worked with Fortune 500 companies on sustainability and innovation. He sits on the boards of the International Living Future Institute, encouraging the creation of a regenerative built environment, the New York Advisory Board of the Trust for Public Land, Sapelo Square, whose mission is to celebrate and analyze the experiences of black Muslims in the United States, and Green City Force, which trains young leaders to power a green and inclusive economy. Ibrahim is the author of one of my favorite books, Green Dean, What Islam Teaches About Protecting the Planet. He earned his Master of Public Administration at Baruch College Marx School of Public and International Affairs, where he now lectures. In 2018, Ibrahim founded Green Squash Consulting, a management consulting firm based in New York, working with people, organizations, companies, coalitions, and governments committed to equity, justice, and protecting the planet. So join me again in welcoming Ahlan Masahlan, our guests. Thank you. That was cool. We live. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. It is a delight to be here. It is wonderful to see so many faces in person. This is our first in-person first year experience since the pandemic began. I really celebrate the fact that we are here at Constantino Room in the Law School at LC and also in Tognino at RH. Shout out. RH folks, we love you, but Lincoln Center is still better. Um, because I'm associate chair here, I can say that. Thanks to all of you who came for faith and critical reason or for reasons of interest. I think it's going to be a lively and fun conversation. And as Dr. Fear Hinzi indicated, thank you also to our donors and to our community members who make such programming possible. It's truly a delight to be in conversation with you, Ibrahim. I have admired your work for many years, the book Green Dean. Yeah, as I think, first of all, I think you guys are joking. You definitely No, not joking. We, <laughs> yeah, I'll show you my syllabi. Hilarious. All right, yeah, and, and a lot of these folks have read your work as well. So um, one of the things that I, uh, well, you know what? I'm not going to leap in. I'm supposed to say some things. OK, three logistics. First. All of you in attendance here and at Tognino at Rose Hill have the opportunity to ask questions. You have been given, I hope, a piece of paper with a QR code on it and or a URL. That's www.tinyurl.com slash FYE question. And at any point throughout this conversation, you can pose a question using that technological thing. And our fabulous. Um, admin team will be collating questions and presenting them to me. And so when we get to the Q&A portion in the last 25 or so minutes of our time together, your questions will be part of the conversation. And again, that's from both campuses. So please do participate. Bring whatever kinds of questions um, you like. And you can also write your question. Oh, to yes. If you're like me, and sometimes you like analog ways, you can write on a uh, note card and hand your question to the student, Maria, who is standing over here by the red wall. Just hold up your paper. Just hold up your paper. Um, second, because like any good professor, I love a good bibliography and list of further resources, there will likely be some things mentioned tonight in our conversation that you may want to follow up on, because you too 
love secondary literature. And so where I'd encourage you to go for that is fordham.edu slash theology slash FYE, otherwise known as the place where you registered. And there's a whole gorgeous list of things you might choose for further reading, that some of which are being quoted tonight. Finally, we have a dessert reception, which is, you know, at least a, a small part of why you came, I'm guessing. <laughs> and that's both here in the law school right outside and at Tognino. So please do stay for some conversation, camaraderie, and sweets at the end. All right, let's dive in. Sounds good. Ibrahim, so great to see you. Great to finally meet you in person. This is a total treat. Uh, it's Ramadan, as we all know, from April 1st through May 1st. This is also, this week marks the beginning of Passover and then also of Holy Week for Christians. So it is a propitious week indeed to have a conversation about religions, climate crises, and public policy as, as forces for good. Um, we've heard about your manifold work from the wonderful introduction from Professor Cuny. And given that we are in this particular point in the pandemic, mm. I wonder if you could reflect for us what the past few years of the pandemic have been like in terms of your work, what has shifted, what has gained more focus, and how you understand your work in the present moment. So first, I want to thank everyone for having me here and um, say, um, before, as Muslims, before we speak, we say Bismillah, which means in the name of God, um, just to anchor that my comments in that. Um, and also just to say that anything good that I say does come from the creator of the universe. And anything that is like off or off-putting definitely comes from me. So um, please <laughs> put that out. Um, just acknowledge that. Um, and also, I look forward to the conversation and the, and the, and the dialogue. Um, the pandemic obviously was dramatic, as we all know. I think the biggest thing that shifted for me was like the personal, um, a conversation that I always have and have been having for a long time is how did people do things in the past? Like, what was the old way? So for example, I always think about things in terms of what, we, what I call persistent human problems. Um, so like if you took some ancient human and you plucked them out of antiquity and you plopped them down in the middle of that lovely green lawn that we all passed to get here and they just showed up, they'd be curious about where they would need to go to the bathroom. They would have to, they'd be thirsty. They would um, be very hungry. They might be tired. Um, there would be all sorts of things that you also have the same concern and also have the same issue. So those are very persistent. So the, the sort of obsession with the past, I think about like, how do we solve these problems back then? How do we solve these problems now? And how will we or could we or should we solve them in the future? So that's usually a frame that I think about for a lot of things. So the pandemic kind of constricted our reality so that everything was hyper local, small scale, and it forced me to think, well, I can't solve certain problems in the way that I thought of them in the past. So I, got, I just got into the dirt. I got, I got into my garden. Nice. And I literally, like, the years before, I had failed abysmally um, in letting, well, not totally. There were some successes. But I realized that the biggest thing about cultivating was, which this is the thing, this is ancient human technology. Gardening. Gardening, yes. or just cultivating and growing food and being able to like make it work so that you could live. So if you, just, just to give you for, as a mental ex exercise, if you took someone, anybody from any tradition in this room, all the people from all over the globe, and it seems like the entire globe is represented in some way and shape in this room. If you took any of their, our ancestors that were alive in 1870 or 1880, and you plucked them anywhere else on the planet Earth, and you said, this plot of land is yours. Mm. They would likely be like, great, where are the tools? I'm ready to go. They would have some basic skill set. Yeah, that they'd all say, of let's us do would it. would be absolutely clueless. It would be like, uh, we'd like look for an app. We'd have no idea <laughs> like what to actually do. So part of me was like, I need to recapture some of that experience and that skill set. So it really was like getting into the dirt. And just re really quickly, I'll just finish this, but it was like getting into the soil. Mm -hmm and sort of getting into like the mixture of the soil and getting into under, understanding how to mix the soil and what it needed and how to read and understand the soil in a very, very specific way. So that, yeah, that was like, I, I was in the dirt digging and 
sweating. It was beautiful. Yeah, and, and the soil shows you what's working and what's not. You know, it's a really good communicator, even without words. That is very true. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. Right? And then the squirrels also let you know what's working. The squirrels do let you know. I, I live on the sixth floor and have a balcony, and they found the six-foot-tall sunflower that I grew regardless. Sunflowers. Right? They destroy them. So, okay, so I'm here... I, I, first of all, we actually didn't script this part, so I'm loving it because one of the things that has been pointed out by a lot of folks who feel disconnected from land, who feel disconnected from yeah. our food sources, is that guerrilla gardening, it, so-called guerrilla gardening, is actually an act of justice seeking. And some of the um, black studies scholars and womanist theologians whose work I find most compelling point out precisely what you said, that you know, after in the United States, during Reconstruction, after the Civil War, it's especially women, especially women of color, who have tended to gardens for survival and have, have a kind of technology mm. of knowledge in their hands mm. that is not always valued by broader society. Um, and, and I think that these conversations about the soil, the places that sustain, the practices that we pass down over generations mm. and what we value are super salient in an age where technology is often lauded as the next great solution to a climate crisis or to some other kind of ecological degradation. So those things are also technologies, so that's the, that's the right. I'm with those, things, those things are 100% technologies. And as part of the exercise for me was there was also a gathering of, of black um, folks that work in um, ecological spaces. So there were folks, folks that I was in community with, and we had a, we were had a, a first meeting in uh, October of 2019, hmm. and we were going to have a series of meetings and come together and do something shared throughout that whole throughout the year of 2020. But that sh quickly shifted to no, we're not going to be meeting because nothing is happening. And then we had weekly calls. Those weekly calls became like our major anchor. <laughs> for us, and what it alerted me to was the fact that everybody here and many people, like a lot of us go out and protest, and maybe many of you are out there protesting, um, but actually what we need to do in many ways is like not be out there so much. We actually need smaller spaces to do some healing, mm -hmm. and so those healing circles was a big part of it. Like a lot of folks need to just go inward a little bit in small groups and figure that out. The last thing I'll say about this is that I wanted my sons to see me in the dirt. Like I wanted them to say, oh, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's just natural for them because now when you say about teaching them, it, I've sort of like a couple of generations skipped us over, but now I kind of brought that back, mm -hmm. brought that knowledge and that, that technology back, and now they can use that. They have that and they have the digital yeah. um, that they can carry with them as they go forward. Yeah, powerful forms of knowledge. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I, I hear too, and I think so many of us resonate with how smaller communities where we can express what's hard, what's been a challenge, what's an invitation, matter so much when there is, you know, a lot going on in the world. George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, protests, and, and this question of how prayer and our community anchors as well as protest mm -hmm. on larger scales go together, I think is a really important dialectic for theological and spiritual conversations. Mm. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, that's great. You know, I, um, I'd love for you to talk to our group a little bit about your book, Green Dean, mm -hmm. because many of us have read it and assigned it. It was published in 2010 and is still evergreen. I mean, it is so readable. You tell stories of encountering various folks in urban ecology movements, in social change movements, conversations about halal and food choices and food systems, conversations about climate and energy sources. That was 12 years ago yeah, right. that that was published, right? Yeah. Like time flies when you're adulting. And I wonder if you would talk with us about what drew you to write that book. Mm and how it's been received. Mm. What have people told you really lands with them? The first, that's funny. The, normally the people will say, how's Green Dean doing? And I usually say, do you have a copy? <laughs> and if they say no, I'm like, that's how it's doing. <laughs> um, uh, so there's a, there was a, um, there's a man named Sayed Hussein Nasser, who is an esteemed professor. He's at, uh, he's at Georgetown now. Um, but he's been at other universities and he was sort of like a, 
he's kind of like the godfather of like Muslims in eco spaces. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote a book called Man and Nature, which was kind of around the same time as Silent Spring. And it was, it was a series of lectures that he had done around the same time. And it was really for an interfaith audience. Um, that was a really seminal book. There was also a number of books by a gentleman in the UK named Fazl and Khan. Um, and he, um, he really sort of started to bridge the gap between the academic and um, sort of like sort of what you read, like a general book that you would read, a general book of commentary. Um, but what I, what I think was really important was that at the time I had been um, working, and my mom just showed up, so I'm just going to say hi. <laughs> Welcome! Um, at the time I had been working um, and organizing around, um, there's a whole world of, of folks working to try and push for green jobs. This is Obama era. Yep. There was the whole push around the green jobs movement. Um, and I was organizing in that world. And uh, you remember um, 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 Inconvenient Truth? Oh, yes. Right? So everyone yeah. remembers Inconvenient Pre Truth. Pre don't look up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pre don't look up. Exactly. That's totally what it was. Um, and it was sort of, it created like the way like a paper in another era, sort of people would get organized and get excited about a paper. Um, the way we're going to talk about um, Whose Earth Is It Anyway, which is another paper that when it came out created a swell of energy um, and movement around. There was also the death of environmentalism. That was another key paper that sort of created another swell of energy. Um, so there was a sense that there was like we were there was momentum around these issues and that there needed to be some, something needed to be done. Obviously, people have been talking about this for a long time and we can get into that and we'll talk about some of the historical context. But for me, I was like, well, it seemed like, and this is pre-Trump, so it seemed like um, Democrats were getting people to be afraid and using fear specifically around climate change. And it seemed that Republicans were getting people to be afraid and using fear around terrorism. And everyone was using and manipulating fear in some way. And I was like, well, what is really going on here? Like, what's really happening? And then my question was, well, where are the faith voices in this conversation? Because most of the conversation were sort of like neoliberal or they were hyper-rational scientists that were, that were secular. And so there was no sort of other space to have a different conversation. In all the movement work that was happening, the conversations were hyper-secular. It was similar to when, in New York City, they said, we want to do um, congestion pricing. Does anyone remember that idea? So they wanted to do congestion pricing. And I worked in the mayor's office just after that time. When I, when I sat with them about that, when I was going to work in the mayor's office in the Bloomberg administration, they said to me, um, what did we do wrong about congestion pricing? And part of what they did wrong was that they assumed we have the right answer and it's just right. So no matter what, if we have the right answer, they have to believe us. Yeah, it'll be self-evident because the facts point that way. Precisely. So yeah. the science says it's right. So, that, so all these things were moving in that direction. I was like, well, that's not how people always make decisions. Mm -hmm. People make decisions in very irrational ways or very emotional ways or very spirit-grounded ways. And that's their cosmology. So the question is, what is someone's understanding of how the universe works? And how do you fit your understanding of what you're trying to get done into that understanding? And how do you translate that? So then I was like, we, someone needs to write about this from an Islamic perspective. Because clearly, Christian voices had always been in there and they were very prominent. Jewish voices were very prominent. Obviously, Buddhists, and Hindu voices um, were very, very prominent in this conversation. And so there was already this discourse, but the Muslim voice wasn't as articulated. Obviously, I said Sayyid Hussein Nasser and Fazul Khan were already in that conversation. But in the United States, there wasn't something that spoke to the masses. Yeah, it was a very scholarly way. Precisely. Yeah. And that was, that was my challenge. And so initially, and this is for those in the room that are going to write a book one day, and for those that have written books, that my initial, my initial thought was, I want to pull together a book of essays and find the people in the work that are doing the work and then sort of tell their, and help facilitate that. For me, um, when I got to a publisher, she was like, that, that, that's not interesting to me. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, I want one voice. She's like, Can you? and she's like, who's that voice? So I went to this guy named Mohammed Shakaki, who's, um, if he ever sees this, he's gonna love that I shouted him out. He's very shy, but he's brilliant. Um, and he's one of my sort of mentors in this work, but he's the same age as me. Um, 
So he's like, you know, we're like brothers. And, and I said to him, I was like, you should write this book. He's like, nope, it's not happening. You're writing the book. <laughs> and so that's kind of how it morphed into me, sort of okay. taking those voices um, and putting together a book. I will say really quickly that the first draft of the book, the people who were like to write, was I gave it to a man named um, Imam Zaid Shakir. And Imam Zaid Shakir is the, um, one of the founders of Zaytuna College. Zaytuna College is the first Muslim liberal arts um, college in the United States. It's an institution that hopefully one day will win the NCAA championship in basketball. It's in, it's in California, right. right? Did I say that? Yeah. I mean. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> that's my secret mission um, in life. Um, St. Peter's is the blueprint. I'm just telling you that. <laughs> um, so um, Imam Zaid literally redacted it with red ink. It was completely red. Love a good editor. I was like, mm -hmm. oh. And he was like, I read it on the plane. And he handed it to me, literally handed it to me. And I was looking at it. I was like, oh. So I have to write it over. <laughs> All over. Completely. So that's how I, and that's how I landed on the structure of the book and found the main principles and gave it some anchoring pieces um, so that it has the ability to speak to an eight-year-old, which was my intention, an 80-year-old, someone who's Muslim, someone who's atheist, but who's an environmentalist, someone who's in the interfaith movement, because my intention was that it would be a tool to translate between those communities. Yep. That is a great story, thank you. And it, it proves a point that ideas don't come perfectly formed, <laughs> right? All of you students know this. And when we professors take the proverbial red pen to your essays, it's because there's something really great there to draw out. It's true. If they, if they give you back a paper with nothing and they just have a grade, you should be really worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the approach in your book. You refer to Islam as a dean, yes. D-E-N. So I'd love you to talk a little bit about what that means for those who might not be familiar with the concept. And then I'd love to um, think with you a little bit about the way that at a Jesuit university, in a department of theology, the way we use the language, the idea of theology, is maybe a little different from how mm -hmm. Muslims tend to think about faith, practice, reverence, mm -hmm. and so forth. And yet in this text, in, in the book Green Dean, you're making a lot of connections that seem to me to be really theological. Hmm. And what I mean by that is you're drawing on traditions of community experience, yep. you're drawing on Quran, scripture, hadith, yep. other sources of historical Islamic knowledge, and you're drawing on your own personal spiritual reflections yep. as you weave together an account of eco-social possible futures and ways forward. So I would love to hear you reflect in whatever ways yeah. you feel appropriate um, ab about how you understand your work as theological, if you do. <laughs> um, well, I, I state very early in the book, and I say very clearly, and I think this is very important from an Islamic perspective, um, there is a very deep tradition of scholarship in the Islamic world. Um, Muslims. Uh, would traditionally learn from a teacher and they would memorize what they have learned directly from that teacher and they would transmit that information directly to their students so that there's a chain of knowledge and a chain of transmission of information that goes back to the, peace and, uh, to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. So there's a, there's a lot of weight and, and heaviness to being a scholar mm. and having um, sort of that anchoring in those traditions. So being a scholar of hadith, which is the, the sayings and the um, practices and the way that the prophet lived, um, there's a lot of weight to understand that because you also have to know the, what the statement was and it's basically the citation and the chain of transmission of that citation. It's, it's very heavy. So I, I, um, that and also with Quran, Quran has layers and layers, there's multiple ways, to, like there's multiple tones or approaches to say it. So someone from um, Pakistan sounds very different culturally than someone from West Africa. And the way that they, the tone in their voice, the way that they recite, um, there's different actual ways, different ways of reciting. So some people are so gifted in their recitation that they've learned all of the, mastered all of the different techniques of how to recite Quran. Um, and the different no and ways to do it. So there's a lot, there's like, someone, someone says always that like, there's always analogies of the ocean within the Islamic context around knowledge and that 
you know, what you learn is really like, it's just a drop of the ocean. Like when you begin to study Arabic, you're beginning to just step out into the sea of an endless sea. Um, so that's the heaviness of scholarship and of that level. So I've always been very careful that I am not a scholar. And the reason why I say that, because I'm not, and I don't have a, I don't have an actual teacher that gave me a chain of information to say, you, to, to teach something. However, I will say um, there is a, a scholar who did once say to me, you have, um, you have a responsibility, he told me directly, to actually go and talk about these issues because of what I have done. Mm -hmm. So when people ask me, uh, often they'll say, will you come and speak? And I'm like, well, I have to speak about it. Because now, I, uh, that, because my, one of my teachers has told me that I have to speak about it. So that's sort of the ethic and the adab or the etiquette uh, in the Muslim context. Um, uh, the word um, deen comes from, um, it's, in, it's, a word, it's an Arabic word. There's an there's a ayat or a part of the Quran, lakum deen wa liya deen, which means to me your way, to you your way and to me mine. Lakum deen wa liya deen. It's a beautiful surah. It's something that, right now it's, it's Ramadan. And you pray five times a day. And if you imagine prayer as like the pillars of a house or of a building, and if you think about your day as being anchored by these pillars, these structures, you build up your day with these pillars. Or if you imagine prayer as like steps towards the divine, and that every day you're basically building another stair layer of that stairway, um, there's another prayer out of that five, there's another prayer in the middle of the night called Tahajud. Now, Tahajud is this sweetness time of the night where you are in communication with the creator of the universe. And is the, it is known as the time when Allah comes down to the bottom part of heaven and is closest to earth to hear what humans have to say. And the angels are literally asking, who is praising God and who is praying? What are they asking for right now? So, I have been in the habit and the practice of waking up for tahajjud. One of the prayers that you say in tahajjud, traditionally, according to the hadith, is that um, the surah kafirun, which has that piece, lakum din wa liyadin. It's a very short, brief surah, um, which surah means just a chapter, but it's a very powerful one. And the basic message is that we don't all worship the same thing, right? Like, we don't all worship the same thing. I don't worship what you worship. You don't worship what I worship. And that's a really powerful message. So I wanted to, when I, so that's the, the deen means the path or the way. The path or the way. So you have a deen, I have a deen. We all have different deans. Thank you. Yeah. That is really lovely. Thank you for that teaching and your communication. So wake up in the early morning and pray. Mm. That's what I'm saying, mm. everybody. Yeah. Even if you're not Muslim, just try it out. And I'll tell you what, when you start to hear the birds chirping, when you literally start to hear the birds chirping, that is the time for Fajr. That's the morning prayer. And I, I don't care what your tradition is, one day you're gonna be sitting there early in the morning, you're gonna be praying right before, and you're gonna hear that bird chirping, you're gonna remember what I said. <laughs> That's a special time in the whole universe. And it happens everywhere you are in the world. Mm. One of the things you read about is this idea, which I believe you learned from your father, mm. that the earth is a mosque. I love this idea. And there are resonances differently framed mm. within Christian traditions. So for example, Orthodox Christianity, ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, speaks of the world creation as sacrament. Mm. Pope Francis has spoken in similar ways about creation as revelatory of God. But it's still a bit different from the idea of the earth as a mosque. And I wonder if you would tell us what you mean when you say that, uh, your understanding of it from within Islam and also from your own deen and the lesson from your father. Well, there's a, there was, um, there's a part that I write about in Green Dean, but I'll, I'll wait, but I'll, there's a, um, it's sort of a, do you guys remember the 9-11 masjid? Everyone was all freaked out about that. Mm -hmm. Some people are too young to remember that. Um, I love that some people are too young to remember that. That's really liberating um, <laughs> for you. Um, <laughs> well, there was a, a building that very close to 9-11, right by downtown Manhattan, 
that um, a, a developer who happened to be Muslim had bought up, and he was having like a come to Islam moment, the way you might have a come to Jesus moment, and um, or I don't know other moments that people might have. Yeah, we, we, got, a, we, got, we got a lot of religious cultural yeah, Exactly, I don't want to yeah. pigeonhole people. All the moments. <laughs> As Luther said, that to which your heart clings is truly your God. I mean, I mean. I mean. Um, he had some good moments. He was a smart guy. Yeah. And, um, and um, so, there, so he was like, you know what? I mean, I have this big building. Let's build a masjid in this building. And it's going to be huge. We're going to develop the building. There's going to be all sorts of stuff in the building. But first, we're going to just make a masjid in the first floor. And they built this masjid. People just started coming to the masjid. It was not really a masjid. It was just a big, huge room, which, incidentally, is how most masjids in New York are, just a random room that somebody has said, we're going to pray here. And they just start coming. And then that's where you see cabs drive lined up around the corner. And you're like, wait, I need to get a cab. But no one's stopping for you. <laughs> they're praying. So just FYI, if you're on 27th around Midtown, they're not going to stop for you. If it's time for prayer, they're like, see you later. Um, so they had this huge, amazing space, and people were starting to come, and people were starting to be there. But then, of course, this was very near. It's like maybe 10 years out of 9-11. So then you had all this swell of people protesting, mostly from out of town. Just want to make that point. Um, and they would all come and protest and protest. So it got to be really intense. Like, I would come there from work just to go pray, and it was like, wait a second, all these people protesting. So one day, I, um, I was like, I was writing Green Dean at the time, actually, and I remember I was like, you know what? I just re was reminding myself that of the story that my dad had told me, which was, well, it's a story that I remember, but it was like, I was at Bear Mountain. And mind you, we lived in the, in the city when I was a kid. We lived in a place in Brooklyn where if you looked out the window, it was just all urban. And you grew up in Brooklyn for? Brooklyn for my early days. Yeah, yeah. Queens, Brooklyn. OK. I always reference Queens just because there might be some Queens politician in here. And, and I, just, I mean, but also, <laughs> we, we have students coming from all over, so point. represent. I know and, Bear, those... and Bear Mountain's like up the Hudson River Valley Correct. a little ways. So it's a bit of a hike. It's a beautiful hike. It's, um, you can ride your bike there if you're very ambitious. Wow. Um, very ambitious. Very ambitious. <laughs> and um, so, so my idea of the world was that the world was just this big city, like this mm. big, huge, gigantic city. Mm. And so when we were upstate, we were hiking on this mountain, um, and we're at this place. And then my dad was like, I have to pray. And I was like, pray? I was like, but we pray at the masjid, or we pray at home. And I remember he said, the earth. Every, you can pray anywhere. The earth is a mosque. And what he was referencing was a hadith where that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that any way you may be at the time of prayer is a place of prostration. Which basically means every place should have the reverence or the sac that should be seen as a sacrament in the same way that you would see going into a church. You're not supposed to spill blood in a church. Mm -hmm. right? You're not, there's holy grounds and holy places. Same thing with a, with a, um, a cemetery. The, the sort of we give reverence, we give some energy to places. And um, I'm like, well, why don't we give that to everybody? So going back to the 9-11 mosque, I remember um, <laughs> I was like, I remember I walked out of the masjid one day. I was like, we don't need a place to pray. We don't need a building. You're right. They were like, yeah, yeah. I was like, the whole earth is a mosque. <laughs> Everywhere. And I put out my prayer again, prayed in the middle of the street. Huh. And that made people feel a lot of feelings. It was very interesting. That, but it did. <laughs> yes. All right, well, let's, let's stick on this theme for a minute about how your very being in the world can be a sign and received in all sorts of ways yeah. that brings up all the feels. Yeah. And, and I want to signal here that we're going to move to the James Cone reading, Great. which, as Dr. Fear Hinsey mentioned, was published in the year 2000. James Cone, the late great African-American liberation theologian and father of black liberation theology, um, who later in his career, he passed away in 2018, but, but this essay signals an integration of multiple kinds of ecological social justice concerns, learning from and with womanist theologians, and a really neat and interesting phase in his work. If I can just interject, he was my professor here when I was on undergrad in Florida. He was not. That's amazing. All right. Well, thank you, Mama Abdul Mateen. It's lovely to have you here. Also, that's that's amazing. All right. Those stories soon. Um, so, so those of you in faith and critical reason have read the essay or will be reading it, 
And the first lines of this essay are very potent. So let me read them for you. The logic, Cohn writes, that led to slavery and segregation in the Americas, mm. colonization and apartheid in Africa, and the rule of white supremacy throughout the world is the same one that leads to the exploitation of animals and the ravaging of nature. The fight for justice, he continues, cannot be segregated, but must be integrated with the fight for life in all its forms. That's the year 2000. I can tell you that this quote, read to me then, reads to me now as potent and prescient. So I wonder if you and I could reflect together on this quotation. What do you hear as true and relevant today in that statement? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm so happy that he wrote that. And um, I'm so glad that you guys are diving into it as a part of your study. Um, we like to dance around the term racism, equality. We don't like to sort of assign any kind of specific blame or at least point a finger in a direction. So most of the time we'll say things like, um, we'll talk about racism as an abstract idea, mm. um, as if there was, it just appeared out of nowhere and then just, oh, that's just racist. Oh, it just surprised us. Um, but in reality, white supremacy is a very specific idea that um, people believe that they are superior to other people. Now it's deep that you don't have to just be white to be white supremacist. Mm -hmm. That um, because of the pervasiveness of the idea that many black and brown people also believe that white people are superior to other people. And what that has facilitated is people who are in power who use white supremacy to control people and dominate the land and rape and pillage land and people and has facilitated them using other people as proxies for that process as well. So that now it's, it's not just the people who are in power, it's everyone else that's involved in this larger system that says, well, if, I am, if I'm, my proximity to this whiteness and white, cult and white supremacy is gonna give me some level, higher level of access. Um, this idea of freedom is something that I also wanna just unpack for a moment in this because the very idea of freedom in, this, in our context, and this might sound controversial, is that it's freedom to do whatever you want. Mm. And that is primarily freedom of white men to do whatever they want. And everyone else is basically fighting for that same level of freedom. And the, the colonization and the genocide and the slavery and all the forces that took over this continent and other continents and where they took things out of those continents, the process of extraction, those processes were about people doing whatever they wanted to get whatever they wanted. If you could imagine the attention that we spent, we, we, we focus on Ukraine, if you imagine if there was a global media that was following the plight of Native Americans in the, eight, in the 1600s or the 1700s, and they were broadcasting that out to the world, look what the Americans are doing. Look what this invading army is doing here. You would, that, the level of shock that you would see, the, the atrocities that happen in places and across the United States is, is astonishing. That's why there's a book, um, The End of the Myth, um, from, the, um, from the, um, the, the, the frontier to the border wall. And it talks about America's understanding of itself and, how, and, our, and our identity. To me, what he does in that quote is that he draws a line from that past to today in a way that made people feel very uncomfortable. Yeah, agreed. And, and one of the things that Cohn does so well is give honor to the indigenous yep. predecessors, yep. land dispossession, yep. the relegating of bodies as property and as expendable um, in ways that I think so many of us as Americans have to learn from. I know I am still ongoingly learning in my white educational privilege. And, and um, you know, one of the things that I have noticed in the last few years is that the causes, the logics, as James Cone would say, and, and the systems and structures mm -hmm. that orient our very fallible imagination, um, they have become more visible. 
to so many of us, mm. right? Mm. So whether it's through Black Lives Matter, Me Too movement, uh, Standing Rock, and the question about what kind of thing land sovereignty, water protection, and direct action are, there are intersectional, in robust ways, intersectional movements going on that, that point to this idea that as James Cohn says, everything, all of these issues are interrelated. Mm. You write about that in, to some degree in your book too. And Pope Francis in his 2015 encyclical, La Dato Si, That's right. everything is connected. And the invitation for us is to explore how that looks in our life and, and how we engage these realizations and these logics that may not have been visible to us before. What, what was astonishing about Laudato Si is that um, the, the Pope does something that faith leaders rarely do now, mm. and that he speaks to all of humankind. Yeah. Right? He wasn't just speaking to Catholics. He was speaking to humanity. I mean, he literally says, I am addressing this letter to everyone on earth. It's amazing. Yeah. And, he, and, he, and he connects pre-capitalism to like post-capitalism. So he gives this like larger scope of the human experience and makes us imagine post-capitalism, which I think was a really powerful piece. Sorry to interrupt. Dude, you can interrupt with Pope Francis all <laughs> <laughs> The IPCC report, yeah. Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, you guys have probably heard a lot of this. Last Monday, a new report was released. And obviously, there are lots of things going on in the world right now that have probably overshadowed that news. But there's also this question about, like, as you pointed out, what place does yeah. the decline of the environment, social dispossession, what, what place do these have in the media? How much attention do they get? Um, and in our conversations, as, as we were prepping for this, you know, one of the things that, that we kept coming back to was what's included in the report and whose perspective is yep. it written from. Yep. Like, these are big things. I mean, these are thousands of pages. They're not light reading. And I say that as someone who does the reading for her job. So, um, you know, I, I want to ask a kind of tricky question here. Um, one of the things that that report curiously doesn't cover yeah. is militarism. Yeah. So it notes the military. It notes greening the military. But there's not really a mention, as I read it, uh, and, and you've been more carefully attentive to this, so please correct me if I'm wrong. There's not a mention that militarism itself is a major polluter. Um, in light of this omission, I think not only of James Cone's essay, but also Martin Luther King Jr.'s later work, especially, for example, in his Beyond Vietnam speech at Riverside Church in 1967. Um, and I want to be really clear here. I'm the daughter of a now deceased uh, naval lieutenant pilot who flew really complicated and heart, for him, heart-rending missions in the Vietnam War. Um, and who was asked to be a blue angel, and he declined because of the moral injury. Um, I'm the granddaughter of a naval captain who received a Purple Heart and captained an aircraft carrier um, later in his career. And I have the honor of being an instructor of many veterans in our program here at Lincoln Center um, from whom I learned so, so much all the time. So this is not a critique of people who are in the military. This is a question about, again, the logics of militarism that are part and parcel of the way society is set up. Can you talk to us about what you see going on there? Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I think it's really astonishing. The number one contributor to global climate change, I mean, to, to global, global emissions, is the United States military. The Department of Defense is the primary. That's so big. Is, I mean. the, is, is the big problem, right? When if, if um, I'll just say briefly because I had some. I just want to give you some of the. Yes, please. The um, 6.4 trillion that was spent on war in the past few decades. Um, out of that 6.4 trillion, think about that number. 4.5 trillion could have funded renewable, a complete upgrade to renewable energy and a complete overhaul of our grid in that same time, amount of time. So we could have already done it. Um, the, there was a, a report by the Institute for Policy Studies. They said how militarism fuels the climate crisis. And there's a couple quotes that I want to just bring up. 
Um, they, they use some really good comments here. We urgently need to shift from a culture of war to a culture of care, they say. And they say, not only do we face ever increasing militarism and conflict in a climate changed world, but the tendency by decision makers to understand climate change as just another national security threat has misdirected resources away from programs that we need to mitigate and adapt to a, war a warming planet, um, climate. So this has basically left our country unprepared and woefully unprepared for the climate crisis. Um, another one is that I liked was, we need to go from a banks and tanks economy to one rooted in cooperation and care. Um, there was a Brown University Studies Cost of War project. The Department of Defense is the world's largest institutional user of petroleum and correspondingly, the world's single largest producer of greenhouse gases in the world. There are 800 US military bases in 90 countries and territories across the globe. Do we need that many? I'm serious. Do we need that many? One of those military jets, the, B2, um, the B-52 Stratocruiser, consumes about as much fuel in an hour as an average car driver uses in seven years. Yeah. That's, that's the scale of what we're doing. So greening the military completely misses the point here. But I will give you a, a tiny little silver lining that I see. Tiny little one. I mean, obviously, we need to dramatically draw down on our presence in other countries. It has literally done way more harm than good. But the flip side is interesting. I've heard directly from people of places where military bases are doing things in the interest of the integrity and sustainability of the base that are the next level technology. We all know the internet that we use every day on our phones and all our devices, that comes from the military industrial complex. Yep. So to me, it's like, what are we creating within the military industrial complex now that is gonna address the climate, the climate crisis and more importantly, the people that are working on those issues right now. Not everyone in the military loves war. Mm -hmm. There certainly are people and people in my own family that have gone to war and have relished the opportunity maybe to kill someone. Hmm. I asked one of my young cousins once, I was like, you're gonna go to the Marines? I was like, but they're gonna teach you how to kill somebody. And he's like, yeah, that's good. I need to learn that. So I'm not saying this as someone who doesn't understand the, the reality of this. And maybe, maybe we all need to know how to kill someone. Maybe we all need to know how to heal someone. Right? These are maybe, maybe these are skills we need to have. And that's, in, that's uncomfortable truth. It's, I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. Like, that is real hard to sit it's with. It's a very hard thing. Yeah. It's, so, so the, the reality, but when we think about it in that terms, is that what we want to focus on, though? Yeah. Is that how we want to orient our society? Because right now, the greatest country in the history of the world, the largest, the biggest military, if you stack it all up, we, that is what we're going to be known for the rest of human history, assuming that we have a lot more to live on the planet Earth. This is our calling card. Yeah. Our calling card is that our military is the worth is literally poisoning our planet. That's like saying, that's like saying someone who has cancer, and they're just eating junk food constantly. And I, that's that's the scale of it. And you would say that's not good for you. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. They're like, but this is what we do. We eat burgers with bacon on it. And as <laughs> and as you point out, there's so much innovation fostered in military contexts. And so this question people, of well, well the, the, I mean, humans are amazing creatures. We are smart. We are creative. We are adaptable. What kinds of powers are yeah. our imaginations so, going to be harnessed towards? So there was a moment when I was in um, the mayor's office, and it was late at night one night, and I was working late, and me and a, a, a colleague were working late, and I got angry about something on, on the screen. And this is a gentleman who had been in um, two tours in Iraq, and um, he was, it was like, and I was, I was expressing my dismay at something that was happening in the global political world. Um, it was an Israel-Palestine dynamic. And I was frustrated about the situation. And I said to him, I was like, listen, man, I don't even talk about this stuff at work. Like, we're not going to go there. And he said to me, he's like, try me. And I was like, all right. So we went there. And he said, listen, and he said, let me tell you something. The people that go there and go to war are the people that don't want war to happen. Mm. So in my... my idea here is that maybe the people that are doing this work 
and coming up with these innovations that you're talking about could potentially be the most important people that we have. Mm -hmm. If we're funneling all this money into the military, those are potentially people that could come out and don't want war to happen, but also want to transform the planet. And maybe they are actually the key to this whole mess. And you know, the military, not unlike Congress, is, the military is actually the biggest provider of socialized medicine in the world. So there's that. Uh, OK, couple notes. One, those of you who have questions, thoughts, reactions, things that you've been talking about in your classes that you want to bring up for uh, our admin team to bring forward for questions, Definitely keep those coming because in just a few minutes we're going to transition to a Q&A part of conversation. Which is now my second point, which is I need to remember that this is not a 75 minute Fordham class as much as I would love to keep asking you a million know, questions I, all day. I saw people leaving so. and I was like, where are you going? Where are you going? <laughs> Okay, so I want to ask, you know, I want to explore like two more topics. Um, and because I'm the MC, I kind of get to keep you all here. So we're going to do that and then we're going to transition to QA. Hold right. on. So Are you guys like leaving now? If you want to leave, just get out of here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking, just no, because there's dessert, man. Like, stick around for dessert. Okay. I, it's all right. You're forgiven. It's all right. You're forgiven. I mean, seriously. Oh, you left. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I like how to go. I got to go. I mean, we all have our stuff. It's totally No, no, no. We have things to do. I respect you. We if you got to go, I'm not, I'm not trying to judge. No judgment. I'm, OK. Um, so here's the deal, right? This talk about the military is a major industrial polluter, polluter and you know, one B-52, one hour equals one commuter car, seven years. It really drives home the point that individual action mm. is not necessarily where efficacious mm. climate action takes place. So just that observation, like a lot of us in this room know that. But we live in a world where it is advantageous, whether it's for corporations or other entities or whatever, to say, oh, you know, conserve, recycle. I mean, yes, do recycle and reduce your use of single serving disposable plastic water bottles. Right. But in addition, um, you know, we need to think about the fact that what we're talking about is systemic and structural change, not just individual action. That's right. Um, Nonetheless, you and I are both sitting here doing what we do in the world because as individuals, we think maybe, we hope, it makes some kind of difference. Yeah. And so, and, yeah. and you know, I just, I'm teaching this awesome class. Shout out to Theology 4444 on Anthropocenes right now. Um, you folks have been so honest in the, the fact that the loads and loads of data, the climate crisis realities, this can become really overwhelming, mm. sometimes almost paralyzingly so, lead us to kind of nihilism. And individual action is sometimes one of the things we have. Gardening, That's as right. you start out with. Right. So what difference does it actually make? And how do you think about individual action given who you are, what you do, and given your faith and practice orientation. Yeah. I'll give you two answers w quickly. One is that there's an artist named Vienna Rye. Um, she's on Instagram, at V Rye. Um, she's very um, provocative and good, good, good material. She um, noted that um, this whole self-care world is kind of like a slap in the face, like a capitalist slap in the face. It's kind of like we're going to like make it really impossible for you to have a life of dignity and then impose this idea that the only way that you're going to be OK and spiritually OK is to take care of yourself. Mm. The privatization of responsibility for problems we didn't create. It's like destroying a forest, she noted, and then coming in and coaching people here. Here's how to take care of a tree. Right? Here's how to plant a tree. So I think that we, we've, um, the nature of our society right now has taken away, like we, we've collectivized some of our actions, military or security, um, you know, like the way that we make money or the way that we assign value to people, whether they have money or not money or things or no things. Um, those things are very, those are understood collectively. Um, but then you, your individual actions have to sort of conform or they're just, you know, like they're, they're a deviant in some weird way. But I think for the perspective of like changing things, yes, you getting a Prius is not going to change the world, right? You recycling is not going to change the world. However, if there are certain things that I like to point out that are scalable things that if you do as an individual, you do as a household, you do as a community, you do as a, 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 a nation, that could be useful. So for example, talk about decarbonizing everything. Right? 
If you do that as a family, and then you set an example, another family will follow your example. Right? You, get, you switch out your gas stove, which is going to be hard for a lot of us, and you have an induction stove. Someone coming over your house will say, I've never seen one of those stoves before. Then their stove is, when their stove is going to go out of style, they're going to be like, maybe I'll get the induction stove. It's better indoor air quality. It's going to be less <laughs> asthma. And it feels cool to touch. And it's not going to burn little Johnny's hand when he puts his hand on the stove when he shouldn't. Right? Like, that's going to lead to different actions. But now, at the state level, we're doing a decarbonization bill, right? There's efforts at the state level in New York State to say no new gas hookups so that you're not going to even have the opportunity to do that. So that's where it becomes scalable, and every level has an opportunity to, to weigh in. Another one is plastics. No more single-use plastics. There should be no more single-use plastics. We all know that you saw the New York Times article, I think it was last week or the week before, the microplastics are in every layer of the yep. ocean. You're drinking and eating microplastics every, all the time. It's in our bodies. So that stuff is like shards of glass ripping at our insides. It's in our blood vessels. That's the scale of things. We don't need any more plastic in, in rotation. There's a, uh, the, 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 uh, the Emirate of Sharjah, um, which is a benefit, like, you know, they have a, um, one of the United Arab Emirates. They have a, a ruler, so this is, makes things easier. Um, so just imagine you as a benevolent dictator, just mm -hmm. have that moment. I mean, moment. Singapore is similar from a water perspective. That's right. So we can talk about Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. right. So they, they have decided no more plastic. We're going to have a completely closed Whoa, really? plastics. So they're going to recycle all their plastics, and they're turning their plastic into thread, because plastic is what? It's petroleum that they, they break down, and petroleum is also used to make clothes as well. So they figure out a, a closed loop with that. There's also this principle of um, um, saving what's left in the natural world. Right? Saving what's left. Healing scarred earth and mm. also. So if you save what's left, so no more development. The, the, I think, what's the stat that, um, uh, I think, in, New York, in the United States, we, I think 10% of the arable land in the, in the world is in the United States. We, it's all under threat from development. We need a movement, and that's why I'm on the board of the Trust for Public Land. At, in, the 20, in the last election, the most divisive election in, in our history, arguably, the only thing, there were land, there were land um, decisions that were on almost every ballot and around the country around protecting and saving natural areas. Left and right, Democrat and Republican, People voted for these things in mass. Hmm. So everybody actually agrees with this. We need to save what's left. That's crucial. And then finally, um, healing scarred earth, getting people back to the land and bringing people back to that natural um, sort of like understanding and sort of decolonizing the soil. So there's a farm upstate New York, um, uh, Leah Penniman of Soul Fire Farm in upstate New York. And she basically is intentionally going about and healing the, the land and, re and sort of making it a place where the, the land is like similar to where it was before colonization. So those are things that we can all do. And if we do it at the small scale, great. And then we set an example, but it also can be used as policy at all these different levels. Sorry. No, don't apologize. It's, uh, you know, one of the things that um, I often say to students too, and we can open this then into questions um, from all of you, is that there's no one perfect answer. That's right. Right? You have to, the language of Dean, you have to find who you are, what you care about, what skills you have, what skills you want to develop, and follow that. There are clues planted for you, mm. or you are planting the clues, but there's not some algorithm of the best way to do it. You find your way, and that's part of the magic of being human. It's part of the invitation. I love that. Um, OK. There's no Let's, AI bot. Huh? There's no bot. There's no bot. No. It's not an algorithm, people. OK. Um, so um, hmm. there we go. It's, it's populating. Questions. Yeah. This is when you need the Jeopardy theme music right now. It's true. Go ahead. OK. Um, This is a question from Molly, who's a student in Faith and Critical Reason. Um, what do you think that theological practices do to help our awareness of climate crises, public policy, and religious witness? Um, you know, I remember, for example, like 
when Pope Francis came out with his encyclical, mm. a bunch of people were like, stay in your lane, bro. Um, that's right. But Shut up and dribble. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly what they said. Um, but yeah, I mean, talk to us a little bit about this. What, what do theological practices have to do with this? Well, I think, I think it really speaks to the role, like how do faith communities show up in, the mo in this particular moment? Um, and the, the biggest part is, you know, we've gotten to this point where this, this sort of notion of deep adaptation where it's not, we don't, we can't, we're not adapting anymore. We need to make some major changes, but we also need to accept the fact that the climate has changed and that so many dramatic events have happened that we're gonna have to figure out how to, to, to think about it. So I think one of the ways that communities of faith and like leaders and spiritual leaders can show up in the best way is to help change the narratives that we're seeing in our popular, popular discourse. So the one way I always talk about this is that we all know about the zombie apocalypse. How many people have referenced that this week? The zombie apocalypse is coming. It's coming, right? So we, the zombies are coming, and they've hammered that in our head. When Katrina happened, there were people coming across the bridge to, to go to safety, and there were other folks that were shooting bullets, guns at them as they were coming across. Did you guys know this? Literally, people were getting shot at. Could you imagine? fleeing a, a, a flood, and you were getting shot at. That's, that's part of that zombie apocalypse narrative, that everyone is a potential enemy. And that's what Hollywood drums down our throat, like just gives us all the time. So I do think that one of the ways that we have to think of it is like, I, I always talk about what is the safe passage around the mountain? There was always like, in history, there was always an ethic in our communities and uh, sort of our etiquette of welcoming strangers of giving food and water to the pilgrim. Mm -hmm. That's part of every single tradition that you talk, talk about. And to me, like we need to really anchor ourselves in our ways of adaptation, in our ways of resilience, and what is our, the way that we hold the pilgrim and work with them. Because many, many ways, migrants are pilgrims. Yes. They're on a sacred journey. And so I think that that is uh, something that, we, so I think we need to start to really think about that narrative piece. I think it's crucial and the other piece that I'll say is that leaders of faith need to distance themselves from political leaders, hmm. right? They need to stop becoming buddies with the president or the prime minister or the, the you know, MBS, the leader of the, the Saudi prince, right? Like, that, there needs to be a real dramatic shift there because um, these people are not, you know, world leaders are not good people. I don't care who they are. They're shady. And, the people of faith don't need to be associated with them, and they need to sort of be moral um, anchors for the yeah. community. The moral, morality is not always the same as politics or legality. That's correct. And there's a place 100%. for it. 100%. So I think that, that that's an ethical question that I think is a really interesting one. Yeah. And, and a related question from um, another attendee is specifically to your practice of Islam, how does your, pract how do, how does your awareness of and practice in Ramadan make you help you understand differently the Earth's needs and humans' place in that? Well, one of the best parts about Islam is that um, Islam is on a lunar calendar, which is different than the solar calendar, obviously. It shifts about 11 days every year, so that's why it doesn't, it seems like Ramadan is always moving. Like, I thought it was, I thought it was, I thought it was, and then it keeps moving. Um, Time is a huge construct, but the moon is forever. The moon is there, right? We're right there. Mm -hmm. So the phase of the moon is important, and so one of the things that really, like, as a Muslim, the, the practice of observing the phases of the moon and when the moon shifts is a part of what we call ibadah. It's a form of worship. So when you go out to sight the moon, so people now are doing these hiking parties to go deep. It's a big whole practice in the United States. It's like a whole movement where people will go into places and they'll go sight the moon um, to go do into nature, to sight the moon in nature, which is what we've done traditionally for thousands of years. And I think that that type of awareness draws people out of their spaces and into the natural world. But also, it reminds them that we're literally on this spinning globe in the middle of the universe. Mm -hmm. And that we're, we're literally hurtling through space. Um, and this thing is vast. And we're just a tiny little speck. What is that Carl Sagan thing? The, the, the pale blue dot? The pale blue dot. We're just on this pale blue dot. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, to me, is part of that. That's one of the traditions in Ramadan that's really important is your awareness of the faces of the moon because that lets you know what, fa what the time of the month it is. A related question from Sean, a student in faith and critical reason. 
How do you find it in you to stay religious and devoted in a world that is increasingly hectic and distracting, whether it's with the very real travails and struggles that we see going on, or you know, digital culture, social media? Um, is it the set prayers and texts of Islam, the more spiritual aspects, a combination, something else? I mean, I think this is really a question about formation yeah. of a self in I, relation to many things. I, my dad once asked, I asked my dad when I was very little, I said, um, what's, what is, who is God? What does God look like? like? And he said, anything you can imagine, that's not what God is. Mm -hmm. And ever since, I've been sort of wrestling with that thought ever since then. And recently I sat with, um, I have this, these two friends. It sounds like a beginning of a joke. It's like a Christian guy, a Hebrew Israelite, and myself. And we used to sit on this corner on, um, in Fort Greene, and we used to like put like a little milk crate and chairs out. We would talk. Um, we would talk about theology and religion and everything. And one day he told me, um, he said, so the Hebrew Israelite said to me, he said, God is not your friend. He said, God's not your friend. He's like, stop trying to get God to be your friend. Like, he said, you have to obey his laws and his commandments. He's like, you have to obey the Ten Commandments. You have to follow those rules. And to me, it's, that's the anchor. The anchor is there's an ancient operating system, <laughs> right, that basically gives you instructions on how to be a human being on this planet Earth. That is a reminder of your soul. Your soul in the Islamic context is a light that in the beginning of creation, God said to every single one of our souls and said, who is your Lord? And we answered him. And then took our soul and put it into, us, into the bodies of our mothers so we could gestate and come out. So we all knew. So everything about this life is about remembering that, that reality. So to me, it's, I try and keep context that context, and also there's a hadith that says that, that this day, will, that earth, the life on earth will feel like a day or a part of a day. <laughs> that when you're done with all of this, you'll be back in heaven, God willing. I'm not gonna say all of us, because <laughs> only God knows. Um, you'll be like, it was like a day or a part of a day. That's literally how it would feel. So I'm trying to keep that in the scope of your soul is literally eternal. Your physical body will fade away. You go, in, you're nine months in your mother, and in nine months it takes essentially for your body to wither away and go back into the earth. Angel Gabriel took all the parts of the dirt and different parts of the earth to form the, Adam and Eve. We are literally from this earth, and then we will literally recede back into the earth. So this is just a temporary place. But my soul has this everlasting quality. So I want to be in the best of terms at the next level. So to me, that's the anchor for me, is not deluding myself um, and to get as close to, as Muhammad Ali always references, he always speaks about the creator of the universe. He doesn't talk about anybody, he, does, he always says the creator of the universe. He's like, I don't care what you call it. He said, this is the creator of the universe. Follow up. Do you think you would have had similar views on spiritual practice human beings and the world if you weren't Muslim? My aunt, Del, yes. in, um, in my mother's, I mean my father's um, mother's older sister, she, um, she in Virginia, she'll, we have these family reunions and she'll sit there in front of um, the frying fish, she's passed now, God bless her, and she'll fry the fish and um, she'll literally be singing psalms. Hmm. So like, I think our family practice is that. And I would argue that um, if we were Ifa or Kadomble, if we were like my uncle who's Hindu, essentially Hindu, who's been practicing uh, meditation for 50 years, that we all have a way that we, uh, we dive into a practice and we get into it. And we, we, um, we learn. And I was once, I watched a panel, it was like the Dalai Lama um, it was the day I met the Dalai Lama. It was a very interesting story, but I'm not going to tell it. I mean, um, I'm not going to tell it. You can't, you can't um, do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like the Dalai Lama and a bunch of other spiritual leaders, including that guy Imam Zaid and his brother named Sheikh Hamza, and all these spiritual leaders from all these different traditions. 
The one thing that was striking about all of them is that each one of them was laughing because they were more interested in how they are doing in their own path than in telling someone else how to be in their path. Mm. And so that each one of our paths is like that ocean. And if we're really committed to it, it's a lot of work. You know, you can't like, so if you're a Christian, if you were raised Christian, and that, that's your tradition, I'm telling you right now, dive in. Read your Bible. Pray every day. Don't take it, don't take it for granted. If, if your parents gave you a blueprint, follow the blueprint, right? And if it was a little twisted and it wasn't good, shed the bad parts. Find the parts that make sense for you. If you were Buddhist, meditate. Don't front, right? <laughs> Imagine your reality like you're supposed to as a good Buddhist. Imagine beautiful things. Because if all of us were Buddhists and all of us were imagining this amazing reality, what would you think would happen? We would all be doing it right now. So that's the, that, you know, we, we have a responsibility to like do our thing and, and not try and tell other people what to do. Hmm. Sorry, I get excited. You gotta stop apologizing, man. <laughs> I tell this to am students. I, hold on, I wanna ask, you, is, am I making sense? Yes. Okay, okay, mashallah. All right, uh, collective sense. Can we go for like 10 more minutes? Are you guys done? They're done. They're done. Yeah, yeah, some people are done. Okay. I want to ask one more question here. Okay. And then I want to close with an invitation to riff. Okay. And then a real invitation to eat all the dessert and drink all the soda. Okay. So, um, is it possible, asks Benedict, a student who is not in faith and critical reason, to follow a conservative mindset in regards to strict adherence to spiritual practices on religion in our modern society? given that many aspects of modern society are increasingly liberalized. It seems as though strict adherence to a practice in itself is, is, is in itself embracing a context of the past. Mm. Is that an anachronism? Does it have any place? Is it applicable to today's time? I mean, I'm thinking from your life and witness, you're going to be on the, hey, works for me angle. But I, this is a real question, right? I, I think that um, you, have to, you don't have to always show all your cards. Hmm. Like, you don't have to believe what everyone else believes. You don't have to follow every trend. Mm -hmm. You don't have to believe everything just because it, it becomes the popular thing to believe or th to say. And if you are not comfortable with things that are in the public discourse, I would advise you to shut up in some ways, hmm. in some places, and know how to pick your battles. Yes, that because is key. Because if, if you decide... When I worked in Mayor Bloomberg's office, I, I, I discovered that as a policy advisor, and some of you guys are going to be in those kind of roles, where you're an advisor to a principal, a leader, 10% of your ideas, no, no, 90% of your ideas are going nowhere. <laughs> Literally going nowhere. And I'm being very serious about that. 10% of your ideas, you have to be willing to fight and maybe get fired for those ideas. Most of the time, we think that it's the opposite. <laughs> so we're fighting for 90%. We work in some high-powered government situation, and then we exhaust ourselves, and then we leave. But if you hold on, and remember, government, you, especially in policy world, you own your ideas. You own your intellectual property. So if 90% of your ideas don't go anywhere, just start your own company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got that. That's your IP. So I, and I think in that sense, I'm always like, as I do have... I do think that you live a different, your rhythm is different, your, your way you, mo you live is different when you are, uh, and, and when you're living in sort of like a, a, a faith-based orientation. But I don't agree with the idea that it's old ways. I feel like all of our traditions have been set up in a way that they are um, broad enough and have enough depth that you can exist at any time in history and they are relevant. Just like all, because they all relate to how we solve those persistent human problems. Mm -hmm. And those problems are persistent throughout all of time and all of humanity. They relate to our relationships. And are we in relationship with humans? Are we in relationship with the plants? Are we in relationship with animals? Those are universal questions, and those are all addressed. In Islam, there's a lot of conversation about how you operate in a marketplace. What's the right way to be in the marketplace? That's universal. So I think that there's a lot of ways that you can be um, yourself and authentic um, and also conservative, but not necessarily have to like 
just jump on to whatever the trend is yeah. um, to be your true self. And I would advise everybody, if that's a struggle that you have, don't do things because everyone else is doing it. Don't even go down that path. Stay true to yourself. I want to close with a question that invites some personal reflection from you. You've been really generous in sharing your personal wisdom as well. And you have been gifted, Ibrahim, with a significant name, oh. theologically, oh. named after a patriarch who appears in the founding accounts of three of the world's great monotheistic traditions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Also in those stories, there is a figure, a woman of varying prominence. Her name is Hagar. And she's one of the servants who's named and yet also hidden in what Jews know as the Torah, what Christians call the Hebrew Bible. There are a lot of ways to tell her story. All right, and so for those of you who don't know the story, Hagar is a woman who appears in the book of Genesis as a slave woman to Sarai, Abram's wife. Unable to conceive, Sarai sends Hagar to be the vessel for childbearing for her husband. She bears a son, Ishmael. Later, she's cast out into the desert wilderness by Sarai and Abram. And there, Hagar and her son, Ishmael, are surely doomed until in a barely there line in the book of Genesis, a well miraculously springs up in the desert and provides them with a means of survival. Hmm. When I teach faith and critical reason, we talk about sacred texts and the figures in them and how we know what their significance is. And so we read this Genesis story the first time just on its own with what people have in their own experience and bringing to it. The second time, we read it with white feminist Hebrew Bible scholar Phyllis Tribble, who tries to recover what it is we may know of Hagar through linguistic analysis and by a feminist analysis that tries to challenge the patriarchal assumptions that a woman would be merely a childbearing vessel, mm. Mm. able to be cast out, and mm. so forth. Starting root to home. That? <laughs> yes, good point. OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, that was that amazing. is that is a theological intervention right there. That is it. Because because for Hagar, where is home? Okay. And then, as a womanist theologian, Dolores Williams, who shout out James Cone references in his essay, "Whose Earth Is It Anyway?" Um, she reads the story of Hagar as an African American woman, and she says, "Look, African American women have been enslaved." raped, have had forced surrogacy and childbearing. For them, God is not a liberator, mm. as James Cone might have it. But God is the one who helps make a way out of no way. Wow. Who provides the well, provides the water. So Ibrahim, who is Hagar for you? And what do you want us to know? Are you guys okay? Can I, can I answer? About God. <laughs> yeah, and then we go home. Fine, we go, then we yeah. go home. Um, um, so, in, in, the, in the, my understanding of an Islamic tradition, um, Hagar was a um, slave in the um, a servant in the in, in the Pharaoh's court, mm -hmm. and Prophet Abraham Ibrahim was um, proselytizing to the Pharaoh, and um, he saw Sarah, and he was like, "Woo, she's fly," um, <laughs> and he's like, "I want, I want to, you know, make a, make my way with her," and he makes a pass at her, and his body gets like weak. And she says, no, 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 this is not going to happen. And then every time he goes to her, he, he literally like freezes. His body like kind of gets like breaks down. And he sees it as a sign of a miracle. And he's like, whatever God you have, I am messing with that God. And he's apologizing to Abraham. And he's like, here, take her too. I'm like, get out of my court and take a, a slave so that y'all just go. And don't, rem I gave you something, just go. And so when they leave, um, the, the other part, Sarah and Prophet Ibrahim are unable to conceive. They, she says, yes, see if you can have a baby with um, um, Hajar. But also, he prays, and he makes a very famous prayer. And the answer to the prayer is that your, your children will be as numerous as the stars as he looks up. So, um, so it was also, it wasn't just that she was a vessel, but that it's also a story of him making that dua, that prayer, that the prayer is then answered. Um, and that's an important element of that story. And Ishmael becomes. Ishmael becomes the, the sort of the line. So the key thing here is that in the Islamic tradition is a little different that he's not, they don't kick 
Um, they don't like conspire to kick him, her, him, her and Ismail out. Um, they, um, God tells Abraham, you have to take Hagar and take her to this random place in the middle of the desert. And he's like, what? And he's, they, they go into this random place, and it's in the middle of nothing, absolutely barren, and he just leaves her here, and, and she's like not happy about it. Mm. And he's kind of like, I'm not really happy about it either. And she says, did God command you to do this? And he's like, yes. And she said, okay, then, I'm, then we're here. Which is also a similar story to when God is about, when God tells God, um, Abraham to sacrifice his son. A very similar test of their faith. So in that telling, when they're out in the middle of the desert, the baby Ismail is crying. She's running back and forth from these two mountains, Safa and Marwa, running back and forth. And baby Ismail is hitting the ground, hitting the ground. All of a sudden, a little trickle of water comes. She comes over to the water and she goes, Zam, Zam, which means collect, collect. And that water just, that water becomes the well of Zamzam. It is the only one of the miracles in all of the traditions that I understand that you can still go and taste today. Mm. I have been to the pilgrimage to Mecca, and that is the best tasting water you'll ever have in your entire life. Second best is New York State, New York City. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. New York City water is pretty amazing. It is. But I'm a, and a big proponent of it. But the well of Zamzam is a really special uh, water. And what's interesting, and I'll just say this really quickly, is that when, when Hagar established that this was her well, and this is a really important point, Hagar says, so then the, 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 there's a tribe that's walking, that's cameling by, because that's what they did. <laughs> um, and they see birds flying over, because in a place where birds don't normally fly over, because now there's, so then they're like, wait a second, there was not birds there last time. Let's go over there. Let's check out what's happening. And they get there, and they see this baby with this woman, and according to the laws and the rules of the desert, She's the owner of that well. She owns the well. So they say, OK, can we have some water? She's like, I have to have control of half of the water. So that establishes her as the owner, which is a really important piece. And it's also important because it establishes the city of Mecca. And that is also important because just like in Chinese letters, where I think the word city also has water in the word city, Establishing and creating a place of dwelling and, and settling in a place, water is essential. Mm -hmm. And so that is, to me, that's the, the part of the story of Hajar. And, um, and being there and walking between Safa and Marwa and drinking the water of Zemzem and circling the Kaaba and being in that space is, um, is absolutely astonishing and, and a beautiful place. So if you have the chance to go to Mecca, if you have the chance to do Hajj, I would advise you to do it. Ibrahim Abdul Mateen, thank you so much. It's been an honor to have you. Let's give thanks to Christiana too as well, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. And there is dessert, not to be confused with desert. <laughs> <laughs> so please, um, mingle talk. Um, we'd love to hear more from you. So thank you for coming and thanks to our wonderful guests.